We are very fortunate to have five very talented creators uh, who have past and present and upcoming projects uh, with, for, with First Second. Uh, and I could go on and on about them, but we'll, we'll talk about First Second, I think, throughout the presentation. So let's just go down the line and introduce ourselves. All right. Uh, my name is Jason Chiga. Uh, I've been making comics for almost 25 years now. Uh, believe it or not, and um, I've uh, I've most recently um, had a book out through First Second called uh, Demon. It's a four volume series, um, and uh, it was uh, released sort of in uh, on an unusual schedule. Um, all four volumes were released over the course of one year. <gasps> Uh, so the uh, it's so not the, true. So no the, way! How'd you do that? That's amazing. <laughs> uh, well, it's not like I drew it in one year. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, all uh, the, you know the readers could uh, could kind of keep up with the story, and uh, would, you know wouldn't have to uh, to wait a year for uh, you know to continue it. Uh, anyways, that's me. <laughs> uh, my name is Mariko Tamaki. I have been making comics for. 10 years, so way less than you. <laughs> um, my first, gra I mean, I'm most well known for the graphic novels that I created with my cousin Jillian Tamaki. So we did a book called Skim uh, with Groundwood Books, and then uh, this one summer with First Second. And uh, I also write for DC Comics and Marvel and anybody who wants me to write comics, really. Uh, and I have a book coming out with First Second called Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, uh, which is uh, something I'm working on with Rosemary Valero O'Connell. Uh, I have been, I've been working on Pashmina, or I had been working on Pashmina for four years, so paltry comparison. Uh, but I've been doing illustration. Oh, I'm Nidhi Chinani. <laughs> I know my name, so, you know. Um, and um, it took me four years to make Pashmina. I'm now working on my second book with First Second called Jukebox, which will be out in 2020, we hope. Uh, and that's me. Uh, my name's Lisa Brown. I um, am working on my first graphic novel, which I'm not sure when it's going to come out. I think 2020 as well. Um, but I do mostly picture books for little kids. <laughs> And um, I also do comic strips, and I have a book of comic strips coming out. I don't know when. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Tin Fam, and um, I've been drawing comics for since 2000, which is what 18 years now. Um, unlike everyone else on the panel, I'm, I'm the one different guy. I don't uh, I'm, comics is not my full time profession. I'm, I'm also a teacher. Uh, so I, I draw comics kind of on the side. So I really don't know when my next book's coming. It'll just come when we finish or I finish drawing something. And right now it's going really slow. So, um, But I did this amazing graphic novel called Sumo, which is probably one of the best graphic novels ever made. Um, <laughs> but it was from first second. And, um, and yeah, so, yeah. Clearly no one on the production side of things here because we're all like, nah, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> well, I do comics and teach on the side. Oh. So, you know. There's some, there's some crossover. There. Yeah, we all, yeah, yeah, we all have jobs. Yeah, well. I teach as well. Yeah, we all work for a living tin. <laughs> yeah, I'm a landlord, man. Sort of. <laughs> Just doodling Maybe some all day. of us don't have to wake up in the morning, but that doesn't mean we're not working. Oh, I have to wake up in the morning. I have a oh, tiny alarm right. clock called uh, my child. <laughs> I have a bigger no alarm clock called my child. Yeah, I don't have an alarm clock. I have a phone. I see these guys work. It's just doodling and checking Facebook all day. So I don't know that's really called work. <laughs> okay, so who who wakes up the earliest out of this, out of this I group? Do. What time do you wake up? I wake Tim? up at six o'clock every morning. Okay, I'm a teacher. I gotta Anybody be there earlier? Time. No, not earlier. <laughs> no, I think Tim but wins. not much later. I wake up around six. I mean, isn't that the reason we all took this job? Is that we don't have to get dressed in the morning? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so I heard, I heard the year 2020 mentioned, and that sounds like the far distant future. Can, can you uh, give people an idea about like the, the life of a graphic novel from, the, from that first little light bulb in your head to when you actually get to sit down and um, you know, see it in the bookstore or on the library shelf? Um, I think I'm the only person here who writes and doesn't draw. Yes. 
Um, so for me, obviously, it's a very different process because I can't do it by myself. Um, so I have to make sure that it's something someone wants to do with me. Um, and I am mostly focused on, obviously, the writing part of it. So uh, for this one summer, it was uh, just this very loose idea about kids at the cottage. Um, and we put together an outline, which was completely inaccurate, had nothing to do with the final book. Um, so we put together this very promising outline of what we thought the book would be. And Jillian did some illustrations to go with it. And for a second, uh, ended up buying the novel. And then we, I go off for like six months and write the script that I write when I work for work on graphic novels, which is a very loose, like almost theatrical script. Um, and then the editors look at it and they say that this looks nothing like the outline and we have this like ensuing conversation about whether or not that's okay. Um, and then I, Jillian and I actually have, I mean, most of the time when I work with an illustrator, there's like an extensive process of like making sure, the editing process for me for comics is making sure everybody's on the same page about what the story should be. So we ended up doing a lot of editing between the two of us. And then it ended up getting approved by for second. Um, and then Jillian disappears for like two years because she works relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, then I see pencils. So I see this like, I have an idea of what it's going to look like. And then it just comes back as this like reality. But I know it's really hard. I know it takes a long time and it's very difficult. But I don't see any of that stuff. I'm curious, do you have any input, like with Jillian, because she's your cousin, but beyond Jillian, do you have any input on choosing your artist? Um, I, generally speaking, I actually have, when you work with, because I do a lot of trade comic book writing, and there you just, you get whoever they decide is the person who's going with you. Um, but for Laura Dean, I knew what I wanted it to look like, and I knew the feeling that I wanted it to have. Um, which is weird because then you only know that feeling when you see the artwork of somebody and then that's the feeling. Like, I didn't go to them and say, I want it to look like this. I just knew that when we saw someone's artwork, something would feel right. Um, and as soon as I saw Rosemary's um, work, I knew that she would be an amazing fit. And then you just, I just prayed. Like, that's so stressful because you're just like, the book won't work if this person doesn't say, it's like prom, it's like prom every day where you're like, please say yes, please say yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, and it just ended up working out that that she was really into it as well. We were like on opposite sides of the wall, apparently like freaking out and both hoping it would work out. We didn't know, we were both like really nervous and freaking <laughs> out. And then when we finally got to talk to each other, once the agent stuff was done, we were like, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. Um, with me, I wrote, um, the graphic novel script a long time ago. And then I was trying, it was my favorite thing and it's the project I always wanted to do. And I was trying to carve out time to do it between teaching and my picture books and my child. And so finally I went away by myself for two weeks and like cranked out uh, 30 pages of pencils. And that's how I pitched it. And it was like, finally, finally I get to do this thing. So it feels like I've been working on it forever um, but it hasn't been forever because I feel like I start when I start drawing is when I really work on it. What's the name? Do you have the name, the title? It's called The Living Doll. Awesome. Uh, my, my process is a little different than, uh, because, uh, because I'm not a full-time cartoonist and I don't depend on drawing comics to like pay rent and all that stuff. Um, it's both a blessing and a curse because it's a blessing because I don't work very fast and I don't have very. These guys all have probably a thousand stories in their heads they want to do. I have none, uh, so like my stories come very like once in a very long time. I get an inspiration to do a story or something like that. Um, so it's a blessing that that I don't depend on that to eat because then I wouldn't eat very well. Um, but it's also kind of a little bit of a curse because it makes me think, oh. I just do it whenever I do it, you know, so I work a, a lot slower, but I get an idea and then I start drawing and me and Jason actually have a little pact that um, we're not gonna, we don't pitch our comics anymore. I mean, Jason might go, at, but like, I don't, I don't like to show, uh, I don't like to be like, hey, publisher, here's my idea. Can you give me a contract and then I'll finish the comic. Uh, uh, we did that, I did that once and it was really hard working with that way because uh, then they want this change and they want this change and this and and because I don't depend on it to eat 
I'm just like, ah, I don't want to do this, <laughs> you know? Um, so it was a lot easier when I did Sumo where I basically finished the comic and then they were like, oh, we like this comic, we'll buy it. And I'm like, cool, <laughs> you know? And then that was it. It was a lot harder when you pitch a story or pitch an idea and then they... They, and they want it this way nowadays. They actually want you to pitch a story. They don't want a finished work because they want to kind of guide you to kind of like uh, do what they would kind of like would fit their mold a little bit more. Um, so so it's a little bit of harder sell if you like do a book and you're like, here it is. You want to publish it? You know, so it's a bit more of a risk. But I, I feel like because... You know, I, I don't need it. It's a, um, it's something that I'd rather do because then, you know, if they don't want it or anyone doesn't want it, you can always just make it yourself, publish it and uh, or like, you know, because it's so easy to like, you know, we used to make minis. We came from the world where we're, we're like Xeroxing our comics and stapling them and going to cons and trying to get someone to buy it for a dollar fifty. you know. Um, and so I can always go back to that. You know, it's not, not a big deal for me. It's, it'll probably be the exact same amount of people that bought the first, second book as the person <laughs> that bought my little mini. So it's not any different. But um, uh, but so so my process is basically coming up with the idea. Uh, and I, I don't really write. Um, so I'll basically have an idea, a loose outline of what's going to happen in my head. And I just start drawing. And then once I start drawing, then look at the drawings, and I'm like, okay, now these people need to say something. So I'll go in and put things in. And it, it makes for a very loose things because it's like a lot of like Photoshopping where I'm like, oh, a word bubble's got to fit in here. You know, like lasso that, move that down, <laughs> put a word balloon in there. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a messier process, but I, I guess it's the only kind of process that works for me. So that's how I've been doing it for uh, however long I've been doing it. Yeah, I think... Um, <clears throat> I'd uh, uh, I'd recommend that way of working. Um, well, I, I know it's hard. It's hard for you, but um, if it's uh, if it's possible, I'd recommend uh, writing as much as you can in the thumbnails of the story because I always felt uh, comics is um, is a visual medium, and I feel the the bulk of the storytelling should be done through the visuals. Can you explain thumbnails real quick? Oh, uh, thumbnails are uh, very, very uh, loose sketches of what each uh, page and uh, each panel on the page is going to look like. Uh, so they could just be uh, stick figures. Um, uh, or they, they could be a little more detailed than that, too. But um, gener generally, they're, uh, uh, they're just a very loose guideline uh, uh, as to what's going to be in each panel and uh, how the, uh, the page layout is uh, going to look. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, after I have the, the thumbnails and kind of a, a loose script of, uh, what all the characters say, um, it's from that point, it's just, uh, it's just a matter of penciling and inking. Um, I like to, uh, I know, um, every cartoonist works a little differently, but, uh, I like to, pencil everything first from beginning to end uh, before I start inking a single panel. Um, that way, if uh, I need to change something uh, in the story later on, uh, it's, you know, it, it doesn't require that much work to, uh, to go back and uh, change a, uh, a pencil uh, as opposed to changing a completed inked page. Yeah, which is why, I mean, versus trade comics, it's so bizarre because comics... Trade comics are like finished, like they go from the beginning to the end, and so by the time you're at the end of this, like, you know, depending on the length of the project, the first part is already finished. Like the first graphic novel I did with DC Comics back when Minx was a thing, the first 20 pages were inked and finished when I was writing the last <laughs> pages, and I was like, but you know, but then you get to the editing process and they're like, you can't edit, like it's done. So you don't actually have because it's such a like concrete medium. Like you can't go back and like yeah, fix it's, things. It's almost like uh, writing a TV show versus a movie or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, for me, from uh, from from start to finish uh, for Demon, it was about five years altogether from uh, from coming up with the uh, uh, with the thumbnails to. Uh, inking the very last page of the uh, of the book so it's a lot it's a long process um, and uh, and I guess uh, you know it's a little disheartening to think about people you know reading the whole thing in a couple hours but 
That's yeah. comics. It took I'd, me a couple days just to play. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. I think it is always poor form to tell a comic yes. book writer yes. how long it took you to read their book. I mean, it's fine if you read it in an hour, but they don't need to hear that. It took them seven <laughs> years or it took them five years. So you can just keep that information in your heart <laughs> and just like thank them for the work they did without like making it seem like it was a race. However, you read it in 15 minutes and then you read it like once a month for the yeah. rest of your life. <laughs> That's okay. It is okay. Like my son knows all the continuity errors, say in Amulet. And we'll tell. Or demon. Or demon. <laughs> There's a lot of continuity. No, I'm just oh. <laughs> <laughs> your, your son should not be reading demon. Oh. <laughs> not yet. He's getting there. I, I, I don't write an, a, a lot in my comics because, one, I'm not a very good writer. And, two, um, I, because of the way I work, I don't want to go back in and put more words in. So there's not a lot of uh, words. A lot of my comics are, are not, it's not silent, but it's like uh, uh, I, I call it poetry comics because I'm <laughs> lazy and I don't want to write words. Um, but like all of Sumo, all the words, if you took all of them, it'd probably be about a paragraph. If you took all the words together. And so people all, all the time, they're like, oh man, I love your comic. I, I was able to finish that in five minutes. It's like, hate you <laughs> because <laughs> because when you read a comic i think people read the words like the way a person would read a novel you know and i think when you read a comic it's it's not really like that like the 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 drawings say so much uh they say a lot more sometimes they say even more than the words you know, like in my comic like like analyzing how i compose the, the each panel and how each panel flows into each un, another panel is pretty much the way that the story that's the feeling. Uh, that's everything that I want. And when someone just looks through them just for the words and just reads the words and then flips through and, and just kind of basically scans the drawing, that's not really reading my comic. That's like uh, reading the back of a you know the, the the back cover of a book and trying to figure out what the book's about. Reading my comic, I mean, if you really were, it would take a lot longer. Uh, and I think reading any comic is like that. Um, if you just read the words, then, you know, of course it's going to not take very long. I mean, de depending on who wrote them, maybe they're really awesome. And <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, you're yeah. getting like, <laughs> a true insight into the human condition. Uh, or maybe they're just like, you know, no big deal. I mean, it's, it's very hard to say uh, what it is that you're getting out of any of the elements. I wrote a bunch of words, and then when I started thumbnailing, I, I was able to take a lot out. Yeah. So yeah. as I thumbnail, I'm like, oh, I don't need this word. I don't need this word. I don't need this whole sentence. Or that's like my your one your one first advice to a first time co comic book artist is to make sure that the words work with the pictures and not the words. Uh, the words shouldn't be um, like telling, uh, describing the picture, and the picture shouldn't be illustrating the words. They should be working together to like tell a different story. So if you're like, do a panel where it's a, it's a red balloon and your their text says, oh, here's a red balloon, <laughs> then you might you might want to rethink how you, you're writing the comic. You know, I, I have, I've also, had Also, what's people, your deal with red balloons, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Why are you obsessed with them? Uh, but I've had people in, uh, like, would come to a table when I was trying to see the book and like browse through sumo and then would be like, well, I just read the whole thing. Thanks a lot. Like, I hate you so much. Yeah. You I should know. have a tip jar. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> now you have to pay for it. That'd be a good tip jar. I like the tip jar idea. <laughs> I think that it's interesting, though, because, like, we're all adults in this room. It's, it's so tell Physically. your friends, don't tell, don't tell comic book writers <laughs> or artists that it took you an hour to read their book. But kids will do this, right? Yes. Kids will. And, and they're really proud of of their oh, yeah, accomplishment. Yeah. Um, but those are the same kids that will go back and read that same book like multiple times. Um, and that's what I like about comics, being able to finish them in an hour or, you know, in a day, being able to complete it also, I feel, opens the door for you to go back and revisit it and then take your time to absorb the art um, and the nuance within all of the work. So, I mean, it's, it's a balance. Yeah. I've had librarians tell me that the, my book is very successful with reluctant readers. <laughs> like people that don't want to read books love reading my books. So I'm kind of like, I don't know if that's a backhanded compliment. But then I thought about it. I'm like, I think it's a great compliment because when I was a kid, I didn't really want to read books, but I love reading comic books, you know. So, I mean, uh, if kids are getting into reading books by reading my comics or by reading anybody's comics, I'm all for that.
That also goes back to that statement of like comic books are books, like, you know, graphic novels are books. So let's just not differentiate them at all. Um, but that's my own. Yeah. I you know, mean, it's a great thing, especially for children, like um, being a children's book writer and having a child who was a reluctant reader. But he wasn't really a reluctant reader because he was a really good visual reader. And comics, it's a whole other skill mm -hmm. to read a comic and to have the text and the image and being able to read them all at the same time. And I think it's like a skill a lot of adults don't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think too, um, my favorite, one of my favorite uh, YouTube uh, series is uh, Strip Panel Naked, uh, which is a really amazing uh, comic book. Uh, this this guy, Hassan, basically like breaks down what it is that you're reading. Like, why is what you're reading so cool? Like, what are the things that you're maybe not thinking about? And he did this really amazing thing on color, and he did a really great thing on, like, you know, timing and stuff like that in comics. And I think it's, like, the same way with literature that you're growing to understand how metaphors work or how a writer uses time or how a writer uses character. You can learn so many things about what it is that you're enjoying. Like, I think that if you're a really comic... If you're a solid comic book fan, then you will go back and see, like, what it is that you are really liking in the comics that you like reading. Hopefully. Or just do whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> All right, so backing up a little bit, before you, um, before you became celebrated graphic novelists, uh, you, were, you were aspiring cartoonists. So how did, you, how did you get your start, whether it's your first mini comic, your first hand-stapled folded thing that you did in grade school. So what's your what's your secret origin? As Jason uh, looks like he's ready to talk. So uh, so like Tim mentioned, uh, I think a lot of us here got our start doing uh, mini comics, uh, which I would recommend. I would highly recommend to um, anyone uh, who's thinking about uh, getting into comics, um, because it's it's a wonderful way uh, to uh, to have a finished product in your hands that you can uh, kind of. Uh, show people and uh, you know bring bring around to shows uh, mail uh, sell through the mail um, even though I know uh, probably a lot of uh, youngsters today uh, they get their start uh, with web comics uh, I would recommend the mini comics route you're old uh, school <laughs> you're so clearly old school um, I would recommend wasting money. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that Kinko's isn't a thing as much as it used to be. It used to be like actually, like I had an office job and we had a photocopier. So that's because that's the thing you need to have access to if you want to do mini comics is you need to photocopy them. There's copy stores everywhere. There's not copy stores everywhere. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you have to show me the copy stores you're going to. There's one in Piedmont I can think of. And oh that's yeah, that's the one it. I go to. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good that's one. That's the one every cartoonist goes yeah. to. <laughs> Very nice over there. I do think the thing that people should consider is that I think anybody who wants to go into comics and wants to write a graphic novel is crazy. You should never start with something that is like bigger than you are, right? Like, and the great thing about mini comics is it's a short story. It's like taking something that's, you know, four panels or taking something that's five pages. Uh, the first comic I ever did was a mini comic version of Skim. And it was sponsored by this Canadian literary magazine that decided it would put out graphic or mini comics by female creators. And I think the reason that I was able to talk Jillian into doing it is I was like, it's 22 pages, you know, like no problem. How hard could that be? Like, it'll be so small. <laughs> um, but it really gave us a chance to kind of like, instead of getting overwhelmed by the amount of work that, it, that comics are, it gave us a chance to just try something out without there being a lot of weight on it. Um, and then it ended up, you know, it ended up being really fun. I always doodled around <clears throat> through high school and college, and I met my now husband in college, and we started like making these funny comics together just for fun. And um, I would get the this regionally published <clears throat> Indian magazine called India Currents, and they were looking for contributors and content. And so I was like, I'm gonna just, like send them this really. I mean, if you looked at it now compared to where I'm at, it was terribly drawn. Anatomy is all wrong. Um, 
It was all muscles. <laughs> it, was just, it was just bad. Um, but I guess the jokes made an impact. So um, they wrote me back and they gave me money. They gave me 25 bucks for okay. once a month <laughs> for, for these, you know, funny strips. And um, it was my first ever paid art job. So I was just over the moon about it. Um, but it was many years later that I even approached uh, comics again. Um, and I did it by kind of trying to do something too much. So I thumbnailed a 200 page memoir that will never see the light of day, but it did land me my agent. So. Oh, can, can I ask you a question about this memoir? Yeah. <laughs> how, um, I might not answer. How far, uh, how far into it did you get? It was done. It like was, penciled and inked? No, it wasn't. Ink. Oh yeah. It was thumbnails. Okay. It was thumbnails, but they were pretty, like, my thumbnails are pretty, um, uh, like, I could just ink over them. You know, it's not stick figures or anything like that. There's a lot of emotion and body language and all that stuff. So I think that's part of why my agent was interested in signing me, because um, she saw potential there. But then there were too many things I didn't actually, like, when she, because she's also, um, uh, Raina Telgemeier's agent, so she kind of put some things in perspective for putting your work out there about yourself. And I was like, yeah, maybe I don't want to do that. So, yeah. Um, I started comics in college where I had a bi-weekly. That's twice a week, right? No? Okay. It's every other week. Every other week. I had a twice a week, whatever that is. <laughs> I knew it was wrong. <laughs> a twice a week comic strip in the school paper um, where it was all about being in college in the dorms. But the, the whole idea was that nothing happened ever. So it was like <laughs> it moved at a glacial pace, and that was on purpose because it felt like our social lives there. Um, and then... Yeah, and that was it. I, I graduated college, and I thought that I was going to go and be a literature professor. So, But I had uh, this uh, advisor who, when he gave me like my evaluation for the class that I was in, it was all about the doodles that I had done during class on the side of the page instead of taking notes, and I thought he was angry at me. And he was like, no, I don't think you should apply to grad school. I think you should keep on the doodle thing. Awesome. It was. Well, I didn't believe him. Money. But he's like, don't apply grad yeah, school. Yeah, don't, don't do it anyway. Yeah, I ended up going to art grad school for graphic design and sort of make my way to illustration. He's dead. Oh. <laughs> Jeez. It just got dark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to tell the story of how I got into comics. How, how long is this panel? Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sit back, you guys. It was 1985. No. Uh, I started drawing comics in fourth grade. Like, I love comics. I was a latchkey kid. Uh, my parents would always work, and so I loved watching cartoons, like Robotech and stuff like that. And all my life, all I wanted to draw was comics, but more like superhero comics. And it wasn't until I got into college um, that someone showed me a, a copy of uh, Goodbye Chunky Rice. You guys ever see that? It's a Craig Thompson yes. book. And uh, I, I love that book so much. And then I started reading stuff like Optic Nerve. You guys ever read Optic Nerve? Mm -hmm. And then someone told me that Optic Nerve used to be a mini comic. And I was like, what the hell is a mini comic? And then they showed me and I was like, what? So I don't have to wait? I can just make my comic now? Mm -hmm. Like I can make my crappy comics now? <laughs> so that's what I started doing in college. I started making crappy comics. And then I, and, and this is uh, uh, a, a story that a lot of Bay Area cartoonists is going to tell you. It's the same story. But um, I also discovered a, another group of people that also did crappy comics. Uh, and it was, a, it was a group that met at Jason Shiga's house every week. And they called it Art Night. And this crew uh, is an uh, amazing crew. Like it, The people that came out of this group is like, uh, like Gene Yang was part of it, uh, Lark Pien, um, Derek Kirk Kim, Jesse Ham, Jason Shiga, Tin Fam, uh, Andrew <laughs> was there quite a bit. And so, uh, you know, we're obviously the best of the Bay Area cartoonists, and somehow we found <laughs> each other, which was amazing. Also amazing because we are Asian. I don't know why that happened. Um, Shocking. But, but, but what happened was, was, and this is my big advice, is if you want to get into comics, find some bros that are also into comics uh, and, and do it together. Because 
the only reason that I'm even published or that you guys might even know me is because Gene Yang got published, <laughs> right? So we were all pals, and I, I actually went to work with Gene. Like, Gene, Gene Yang is pretty much responsible for my entire life. He's the one that introduced me to my wife, now my ex-wife, so I'm kind of mad at him about that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, like, uh, he's the one that got me uh, my, my teaching job. And then knowing him, when he got published with American Born Chinese, uh, actually, Derek got published first with First Second. And then Derek was like, you got to publish my friend Gene. And then so we pub he, they, they published Gene. And then, of course, Gene became successful. And then pu then was like, you got to publish my friend Tin. And then I got a, a publishing deal. Obviously, that the line ended there because I wasn't very successful. Was no, didn't pull anyone up after me. But I mean, without knowing this crew of people that I drew comics with, I would have gone nowhere in comics. You know, if I was just at home doing it myself, there was no way that I would have been any, you know, I would be published in any way. So my big suggestion is find bros. Get your Gene Yang. Where yeah, is your Gene Yang? Yang? Because and, and be nice to people because Marika, that person that you Yang. might be mean to I'm might be your Gene <laughs> Yang, and you don't know. Like Gene Yang is not a cool guy. So no, I, and I'm a pretty cool guy. So normally I would not hang out with Gene Yang, but because I was a nice guy at this one particular time, look at me, I'm published. Yeah. That's cool because I, mean, I was happens to be nice to the nerd. I think that for a second is, I think for a second is kind of unique in that way because it is a place where there is this kind of sense of like a group of people, especially in the early days, who are sort of connected to each other and know of each other. And comics is a unique medium in that there, the way that people publicize comics is to go to this party where everybody sits at a table for hours and hours and hours and hangs out with each other mm -hmm. and like reads each other's stuff. It's not like a literary event where you go, you read something and then you have cheese and you go home. Like you literally sit there for two days all yeah. day and get to know people. Um, so that's why, you know, like you have, you have to put in the time and, you know, be nice like Tin and go and, <laughs> and meet people and go to conventions and like chat people up in a non-stalkery way. And that is <laughs> yes, one of the ways to get into publishing. Yeah, Jason don't be a Shiga stalker. is a huge part of the Bay Area comic scene um, just because of, of this art night thing. And I, 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 I don't like Jason very much, but what? I do <laughs> give him the credit of, of being like an influential. And so is Did you uh, have Andrew. snacks at your house? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so is Andrew because uh, the cartoon art museum back then uh, still is quite a hub for people that do uh, comics. A lot of uh, us volunteered at the ca cartoon art museum and met at the cartoon art museum. So the cartoon art museum is a big hub for for new comic people that are coming so in. So I was like yeah. one Asian too late. Like I could have yeah. been in the Asian posse too yes. if I had been there like a couple of years, but I don't draw. Well, we there's, there's something to be said for like not knowing anybody or anyone and having a hard time making friends um, and, you know, just kind of knocking on doors and seeing who would open, mm -hmm. um, which is how I went about it. I Well, I mean, I dropped out of the Academy of Art and then I started drawing um, just pushing myself to finish a full illustration every day. And at a certain point, somebody asked me if I could, if they could buy a print that I didn't know. And I was like, oh, I made it. <laughs> um, somebody wants to give me money for this drawing that I just did because I'm forcing myself to draw every day. Um, and then from that point forward, I literally went to, we, we were living in the city at the time, and I went to shops and I was like, this is my artwork. Will you carry it in your shop? They hate that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like most shop owners I know now, they're like, I hate it when people bring their stuff in and ask me on the spot to make a decision. But luckily for me, there was a shop um, in my neighborhood that when I did that, she was like, yes. And it was the first shop I ever sold with. And it's and for me, I didn't know anybody who was doing any art, not in growing up and then not at that point. So um, there's a certain... Uh, Thing to say also about just trying, you know, just trying to get your foot in the door, um, having no, no connections. Well, no ultimately, connections. it's the art, it's mm -hmm. the book, right? Like yeah. that's the ultimate thing. That I mean, if working on if the you art, right. can't either make or finish or make a book that your publisher thinks that they can publish, then <laughs> even if you're in Jason's house eating snacks all day, it doesn't matter <laughs> if you can't make a really cool book. Yeah, Tin's being Tin's being really modest, but if if he'd uh, yeah, if even if he didn't know Gene Yang and he submitted Sumo, they would have been yes, we we love this book, we're gonna publish it. 
Yeah, your Jean Yang story sucks, man. That's not even true. <laughs> it's all about Jean Yang. That's, 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 that's my holes. next graphic novel about how much I love Jean Yang. <laughs> Jean, a memoir. Yeah, yeah, Jean Yang, a memoir. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Jean. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, did he die? What happened? Yeah. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> yeah, Jean's great. <laughs> hope, I hope he gets to watch this when it's online. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he's not going to yeah. do that. And uh, when Mark Siegel, who's the creative director of First Second, when he was here uh, to open this exhibition, he talked about Gene and how much, um, really couldn't say enough about how much of a game changer American-born Chinese was. And it's it's amazing to us because we saw it as a mini comic and a web comic, and then it became this, you know, this driving force of graphic novels. And um, when we when we were teaching together, every day Gene would come to me and be like. Why are we doing this, bro? We're losing money. I, I'm gonna stop trying. Yeah, like it was like for a long time, it was like a a big money losing endeavor. I had to um, to get him to agree to keep printing American born Chinese as a, a mini comic. I had to agree to actually do the xeroxing and the putting <laughs> together of the book myself. Like just because I, 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 I love this book and I wanted him to keep doing it. But he, like, we all had, like, a lot of self-doubt about mm -hmm. why we were putting so much time into this comic. And obviously it paid off, but, I mean, um, yeah, the, well, there was a time that nobody wanted these books. And well, self-doubt is an important elixir yeah. in the creative process. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to hate yourself at least, like, <laughs> one-tenth of the day is, like, you feeling, like, such a fraud and, like, <laughs> yeah. sitting in your kitchen, like, you know, fear eating, like, whatever's in your cupboard and hoping nobody knows the right. truth about how scary it is to make a book. <laughs> Maybe Jean doesn't feel that way, but every time, every time <laughs> someone buys one of my book, I go oh, fold another one, <laughs> pick another one to this. All right, and I think we'll, we'll have time for a few audience oh. questions. So if anybody, audience, or we can keep talking. There's still yes. plenty to talk about. Yes. <laughs> Well, I can say that that's not true. I think I'm the perfect example of the fact that that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, because we submitted a book that had something that has since become a large issue for people as to whether or not it is a young adult book. Mm -hmm. We we got very minimal notes. First Second was incredibly supportive of what we wanted to do. I mean, our goal was to make a book that felt true to us and... There's definitely things in the book that I think <laughs> that many people have made a case are not appropriate for young adults, and our goal is to make a book about young adults, not for them, per se. Um, so we didn't have any, any of that experience at all. And they've been incredibly supportive throughout the whole process of people having different thoughts on the book. It was the most banned book. It was the most banned book in America in Woo! 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most challenged book, uh, which doesn't sound as sexy as banned. It was the most challenged book. But and, I that's, think and that's this one summer. This right? one summer was the most challenged book of 2017. Um, I don't know. Oh, wait, 2016 maybe. I don't know if it was the most challenged last year. It would be cool if it was. Um, Two years running. I know. <laughs> I know. I think I was like... We were you talking get a sticker for that for the cover, right? No, you don't get a sticker. <laughs> you don't get a sticker, you get infamy. Um, you get all the angry emails? Uh, no. Good. No. Oh, that's but good. then someone told me, yes, you don't get angry. You don't get direct emails about that stuff. You get indirect comments about that stuff. Um, but the other thing I'll say is that I think uh, the editorial process of First Second has always been uh, very much about kind of working with the creators to kind of create the best story that they can create. And I think that that is not always true of people who are making content for young adults and children. So um, I, I think that they're pretty amazing in that respect. I think that, so sorry, I'll, I'll just say for each person, I think the process is different and depending on who you're working with as your editorial um, uh, 
person, your editor. Uh, and um, and so for me, I, I pitched and submitted my book when it was in a script stage. And then from there, there were editorial notes. Then I did a section of thumbnails and again, editorial notes. And so there was a lot of editorial throughout, but none of it was I want you to change this. I want you to add this. N most of it was just questions. So my editor is Mark Siegel, and I'm now working with him on my second book. And Pashmina, because it was my first book, I was learning a lot. I threw out the script for Jukebox um, because when I, <clears throat> in my experience with Pashmina, going from script to thumbnail, um, so much changed that I felt like skipping that step would hopefully skip me forward because um, Comics are long and hard, and drawing that much is painful. Um, so I want to do anything that can fast forward that process, even though I know it's totally not going to fast forward anything. Um, and so now where I'm at is I am sending him um, kind of like 50 to 70 pages at a time. Well, at least that's the goal, um, at least to get to a story point where I feel like there's enough of the story there that we can look at it as a whole and then have comments and conversation and change. Um, so that's my process, but I'm not baller like Jason and Tin where I'm just going to give them finished artwork and be like, well, you don't want to change this now because it's finished. Um, <laughs> I, I like and appreciate the editorial process, uh, but it does mean there's a lot more work. But it is in service to make the best story. So I think that if it was different, I might be like these guys and be like, no, just here's my finished work. I don't want to change it. No. When I pitched my book, I didn't know what age level it would be for. I thought maybe young adult, and then we decided to skew it a little younger. And it turns out that it's not that, there's not that um, very hard and fast boundaries. So all I had to do was change a little bit, and then younger kids can ex access it, and it wouldn't be too nasty for them. Yeah, I, I totally disagree with the, uh, the, um, the thing about for a second being more of a young adult. A publisher. I think the reason that it gets that reputation is because uh, the more the the ones that are the books that are popular and the ones that you see a lot are young adult books because young adults just seem to buy more uh, graphic novels nowadays. So so then it gets that. Up. But I mean, if you read Demon, <laughs> that is <laughs> not sweet. a young adult book. That's not even a, like a. Uh, a twenties, but you have to be like you, you have, have to be, be a forty old. comfortable yeah, you have 40. to be like a forty-five year old man to read that book. It is hardcore. Uh, <laughs> it was, um, there was a scene in Demon where I guess uh, one of the one of the characters makes a a, a, sh a shank out of dried semen. Mm -hmm. um, and when I when I was submitting it to uh, for a second, I was you know I, I told the editor, you you either. You you either accept the 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 cum shank or or I'm taking it I'm taking it elsewhere <laughs> or I'm walking it's, it's it's all or nothing you either you either take the cum shank the sex fighting and the camel sex or not you get nothing and uh, so many people have used that as an approach to negotiation <laughs> yeah Callista's like not again <laughs> why always with this cum shank we've all done it. But uh, but yeah, they they accept. She she actually told me the uh, the cum shank was her favorite part of the story. Yes, I I, I gotta say like um when I say I, I it might be a misunderstanding when I say that um that you know that they're going to they they'll have more editorial notes. It's not to push it any way. I think their goal is to make it a better story. And they're they're editors. They've been through this and they know what makes it, what reads better and all that stuff. And it's probably true. It's it's probably will read better. I'm just a lazy dude, and I don't want to do that work. And that's why that's why I would rather them buy a book that I finish than a book that I have to like work really hard with them. And even though it's going to be probably a better story, um, I, they've never pushed. Uh, when I work with them, never pushed to make it more like young adult or more like any way they want. They basically look at what you are trying to say and try to get you to say it better yeah. and in a, in a better way. I'm just like a baby about it. So, I mean it <laughs> so that's what it is. I really feel like actually in, because I write middle grade as well now too, and I feel like there really is like, you know, if you're with the right publisher, like it really is so much more about the story. And I've actually been very lucky never to have a conversation where someone has said like, um, I don't think that this is going to be, I actually had like, we, what was the word we used? I think there's even, 
in the last book I didn't like the word esoteric. <laughs> and then we had this whole conversation of like, that's gonna you have to look that up. Like if you're a middle grade reader, you're gonna have to like that's gonna be a moment. And they were like, okay, well no, look it up. You know, it's not it's not like we're writing like nor let like Judith Butlering the whole thing or it's like impossible. But like mm -hmm. I think that there is so much more leeway now for like creating content for younger readers. Yeah, like what even is YA now? Like I write a book and it's not geared towards anyone, but just because I don't use bad words or nudity or anything like that, the, people were like, oh, you're kind of a YA car, but it's like... You're I just a clean guy. Like, oh, yeah. You're just clean. I'm just, uh, I'm just a nice, you know, guy that doesn't like that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sensitive. I'm not a YA writer. I'm just sensitive. Yeah. Any other questions out there? I was trying to think if I have a question. <laughs> who's who's the most sensitive person on this panel? The most sensitive? Much Tim. Oh, geez. Tim. Maybe Tim. Tim. It's, it's teaching. It's made me more of a, like, like now that I, I've been teaching, like, high school, uh, and I, I, I have to watch my language and watch inappropriate things around kids, I, I've taken that into my real life now. And so now, like, I never swear. I say F all the time. And, and yet, know, like, F the F history... Over. The history of people who write for kids is a is a, you know, dirty language people like Dennis Lee and uh, what's the name of the person who wrote, um, where the wild things are. Maurice Sendak. Maurice Sendak. Sendak. You know, like Michelle there's Silver a long Stone. history of like, you know, sketchy people writing. Like, <laughs> if we're writing into that, that's what we're writing into. I think it's interesting though. Like one of the biggest critiques that I've gotten of Pashmina is it doesn't fall like properly into one. Uh, age level so it's middle grade and YA because she's a teenager and people ask me about it in interviews and um, you know at signings or whatever and I find it really irritating if I can say that like because we're so focused on like what age like how who are we buying for what group who are we putting this in um, to school libraries for and I think that Cross-culturally, that's not necessarily the same. I think that the U.S. market is definitely preoccupied with age level. Um, and I think that you can read younger and you can read older. I, growing up, I didn't have a lot of friends, so I read a lot of books. Um, and I always read up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that there's, there's yes, you know, gift guides and um, school curriculum guides. But we also need to not be so stringent about those rules. Um, so yeah, man, relax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just write what you want. Exactly. Don't worry, just write don't a good worry story. about it. I'm Shank. <laughs> <laughs> All I read is young adults. Like um, mm. this is the thing. Who's reading Harry Potter right now? Forty year olds. <laughs> yeah. I, All I read is like uh, Rainbow Rowl and everything like that. Like I don't like books that are not for young adults. That's why you're like an innocent guy because you're reading Rainbow Rowl and yeah. four dollar. <laughs> <laughs> take out meals. <laughs> okay, and we want to leave some time for book signing and checking out the exhibition. So, starting with Tin, let's let's just talk about what you have coming up next, comic wow. comics or otherwise. <laughs> uh, I I do a semi uh, regular comic strip in the East Bay Express called uh, I Like Eating, and it's uh, I have somehow fooled them into uh, uh, paying for my food, and then I review food uh, through comics form, even though I know nothing about food or whatever. All the strips are basically <laughs> like, oh, I think this is good and cheesy. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I, I, and then I, I'm working on another graphic novel, but you know, who knows when that will be finished? And it's gonna be about uh, pho uh, and my awesome. relationship to it. So uh, yeah, the soup. And so, uh, so hopefully that will be done before I die. <laughs> I just got really hungry. Um, I have to finish this graphic novel. That's the first thing. So if Callista, you're listening, I'm going to do that. Um, I have a collection of comic strips that I did for the Chronicle and a lot more that I did for the book um, where I review. I sum up a classic novel in three panels. So, really well. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm doing a hundred of those, so it's gonna, taking a while because I, I read all the books. And uh, I have a new picture book coming out in March that I illustrated. So What's it called? It's called The Too Much Sisters. Nice. And it's coming out end of March. What was the last one, the last picture book you 
It's called Goldfish Ghost, and it's about a dead goldfish. That one's so awesome. I love that Thank one. you. Um, so, Those yeah. The books I, read. <laughs> <laughs> I read a lot of picture books, too, because that's what I teach. Um, I am working on three books right now. Uh, my picture book should be out next year, 2019 spring, I think. It's called I Will Be Fierce, written by somebody else. I'm illustrating it. Um, by who? Uh, Bia Birdsong is her pen name. I only know her pen. I know she has a real name. Um, it's somewhere in my brain, uh, but I can't bring it up right now. Um, and then um, I'm also, this isn't officially announced yet, but we kind of talked about it on social media. Um, but I'm working on a bilingual uh, board book, which is in Hindi and English. Um, so I'm really excited about that one because we're raising our daughter bilingual and there is like pretty much not anything out there that's like that. So it's called Shubratri, which means good night. And then Jukebox is my next graphic novel with First Second, and that'll be out in 2020. So it'll, the board book will be out this year. The picture book will be out next year. And then Jukebox 2020. So a book every year. Yikes. Woo. Um, I am finishing up my She-Hulk series for Marvel. So the second to last one is out tomorrow. Uh, which is 163. I uh, just announced I'm doing um, a graphic novel for the new DC Inc., uh, which is their YA imprint um, with DC Zoom. So I'm doing a book with Steve Pug, who's amazing, uh, called Harley Quinn Breaking Glass, um, which is like taking so stressful <laughs> writing it right now. Um, and I, um, what else am I doing? I have a novel that I'm working on about uh, losing your virginity because I like to keep it classy, obviously. Uh, and then Rosemary and I have Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, which is coming out, I think, spring of next year. Yikes. Oh, yes, that's it. Thank you. And I am writing the middle grade uh, prose series for, the Lum uh, for Lumberjanes for Abrams Books. And the second book is called The Moon is Up, and it comes out, um, I think, this fall. And then when you're done with all that, you'll write something for me. I know I will. Uh, and The Lumberjanes is illustrated by Brooklyn Allen. Um, I'm working on a larger project right now um, about, uh, about a young woman re returning to her hometown um, after uh, an attempt at uh, a writing career. Um, and uh, it alternates between her story and uh, the science fiction story uh, that she's writing. Um, and, uh, I guess the, uh, it has an unusual format in that it will be, uh, interactive, um, kind of like a choose your own adventure book. It's insane looking. Um, Crazy, guys. and it's, uh, it'll be, uh, gonna publish it. <laughs> as expected from Jason. No, it's going to be really it's cool. Awesome. So, so amazing. No, there's only, there's only three spines in this book. <laughs> Tim's exaggerating. Um, but yeah, three spines. Each page will be a unique shape, um, and the uh, the readers will basically be able to uh, follow the story from uh, one set of pages into the other set of pages. Um, and it's uh, it's kind of complicated, but the uh, the idea is when you're reading one book, the um, the pages in the other book uh, sort of serve as the uh, the memory of the uh, of the story, um, keeping track of inventory and where you've been, the time. Uh, so it's almost like a, a little video game. Um, but uh, that's what I'm working on right now. All right. So cool. I'm, I'm writing a Voltron history book, but you read it front to back, and it's all <laughs> in order from <laughs> the 80s all the way to present day. But um, I should also mention the Cartoon Art Museum has some big programs coming up this week. So Friday night, uh, Nate Powell, the illustrator of the March graphic novel trilogy, will be at the museum. Uh, on Sunday, we're hosting Nitty uh, for the closing reception of her um, she, uh, her exhibition. She's the first emerging artist showcase uh, artist featured at the new mu Cartoon Art Museum space. So I've emerged now. You've emerged. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> and After you are. That, that evening, we're hosting Nick Park, who is the creator of Wallace and Gromit. 
so I hope you can all come and check that out. And we want to thank the library very much for hosting this event and the exhibition. Uh, Let's hear it for our panelists and hear it for Andrew. Yeah.